Hello, and welcome to the third lecture of our Introduction to Machine Learning course. We continue talking about linear regression today, but we switch the perspective a little bit and talk about uh, probabilistic models and, and sampling properties. So, so far in this course, whenever I said a model, we were fitting a model, this word model referred to a family, a parametric family of functions that um, we wanted to fit to some uh, to some given data set. So for example, we were talking about linear functions. Um, if we, there's only one variable, it's a family of, 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 li of straight lines parameterized by two coefficients. We want to find the coefficients that fit the data the best. And today we will talk about probabilistic or generative models, how they're also called, um, which for linear regression would look like that. So it's almost the same, there's just one little twist, we add epsilon in the end, and the epsilon is the um, a, a, a random variable, it's a Gaussian random variable with mean zero in some variance. Um, so this means that, here's how you should think about that. If the beta, the true underlying beta is given, and some x variable is also given, you chose it for example, then you can sample epsilon values from this Gaussian distribution and this will generate um, the values of the response variable y. You can do this for a bunch of different x points and this will generate an entire data set together with some noise in it. So a generative model is something that you can, it's like a box that can generate data sets for you. And then one can think, for example, what happens if you generate data set and then each time estimate the coefficients by a least squares procedure like we talked um, in, in, the, in the first lectures, how close your estimated beta will be to the beta that you put into the model. And this is something that we um, want to explore today. But we will start with a short, brief recap of probability theory um, to bring everybody up to speed with the notions of distributions um, and so on. Okay, so probability distributions can be discrete or continuous. They can also be mixed, but this uh, we will not be talking about today. Let's start with a discrete probability distribution. I assume that everybody's familiar with this concept. So discrete random variable x can be described by a probability mass function, which tells you what is the probability to obtain each possible outcome of your um, of your random variable. So let's talk about dice, for example, as a standard example. You throw a dice, it comes out as number one to six, so this is the, the possible values of your random variable. If the dice is fair, then all outcomes are equally probable, right? So you get one over six as a probability. This is a uniform, discrete uniform probability distribution. And this, this fun if you think about this, this plot as a function, then this is called a probability mass function because it's just concentrated on several uh, discrete values. A slightly more complicated example, if you throw two dice now, then you can get values, you add, um, you add the, um, the values, you can get a number between two and uh, 12, right? Two is not very probable, 12 is also unlikely, the most likely number is seven, because there's many combinations, six in fact combinations that yield it, so the probability of, of seven is one of over six, and here on for two and 12 you get one over 36. These probabilities have to, have to uh, satisfy two requirements. One requirement is that they're all not negative, they can be zero, but they cannot be negative, and another requirement is they should sum to one. Okay. A continuous probability distribution is something that can take um, values, for example, on a real line, right? It's, it, 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 it's not a discrete set of values that this variable can take, but the entire, the entire real line is, is allowed. And they are described by something called probability density function. So here is an example. Um, to give a concrete example, for example, we can, we can we can talk about distribution of heights of, of the students of this course. So if you think uh, about measuring the height of each one of you, um, they can be like values between, I don't know, one meter and, and three meters, let's say, uh, but it can be any value there, right? So we, we have this 
distribution that describes how likely each of these values are. And what people are sometimes confused about when talking about probability density functions is that the probability of each specific value, for example, probability of obtaining height equal to one meter 80 centimeters is zero. Is zero because 1.8 meters means 1.8 and 0, 0, 0, like zero millimeters and zero microns on top of that. And this is just has uh, probability zero. Um, what you can meaningfully talk about is the probability that you get 1.8 meters plus minus one millimeter. So you're looking at some range of possible X values and you're asking what's the probability to get into this range. And this is something that PDF then can answer you. So you're looking at this range over here and you compute the integral of this function in this little small narrow band and or, or not narrow, whatever, the integral over, over some interval gives you um, the probability to, to get into this interval when you, when you make a random draw. Which means, of course, that this entire function has to integrate to one because you will obtain some value with probability one. And again, it cannot be negative anywhere. Um, two important things that we'll talk a lot about today are the mean or expected value, as it's alternatively called, and the variance of probability uh, of, of random variables. Um, so let's define those. For a discrete random variable, that's how the um, expected value is defined. You see it there. Um, that's just that so you just sum all the values weighted by the probabilities. If something has a very low probability, it doesn't influence the, the average. If something has high probability, it influences it strongly. If there's several values with equally high probabilities, you just average them, right? So it's the mean. Very intuitive concept. Um, the variance is slightly more complicated. It's the expected value of the squared deviation from the expected value. So this means here's your mean. Every time you draw a value, you get something around the mean by definition. You look at the squared deviations, you square, so you get something that is always positive, and you compute the expected value of that. And this is your variance. So variance measures how far away from the mean the values of this random variable typically are on average, right? So we can plug the, the formula for the expected value and we get the, this expression for a discrete random variable where you just sum over all possible outcomes and obtain the, the value of the variance. For a continuous random variable, it's very similar, but you have to replace all the sums by the integrals. So to compute the expected value, you it's, it's the integral um, of x times p, and x, so p was the, uh, was the probability density, and you integrate it um, weighted by x, like, like in the sum above, um, and that's the answer. And for the variance, so the formula, the conceptual formula for the variance, that is expected value of the squared deviation from the expected value, this stays the same, whatever your, it's the general definition that applies for any random variable. For a continuous, again, we have an integral and, and, and so on, as written here. Good. Um, then we will need something that is called covariance. So we define variance on the previous slide like this, but if we have two random variables, can be continuous, can be discrete, anything, then we can very similarly define a covariance between them as, 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 as written here, right? So this measures how, how they deviate from their respective means together. If they both tend to be on the right side of the mean and both simultaneously tend to be together on the left side from the mean, for example, then they will have positive covariance. If they vary completely unrelated to each other, then the covariance will be zero. And this is actually uh, the, the, the definition of uh, uncorrelated random variables. So note that if you plug the same variable twice in the covariance, so covariance of x and x is just a variance. And um, yeah, as I already said, if x and y are uncorrelated, then the covariance is zero, and that's basically the definition um, of that because, as a reminder, the correlation is scaled covariance. So we scale covariances by square roots of the respective variances, and one can show, which is not exactly trivial, but one can show um, that this value, the correlation, will always be between minus one and one. It cannot, the absolute value of correlation cannot be above one if it's defined like that. 
uh, whereas covariance can take can take any value. But zero covariance means zero correlation and vice versa. Okay, good. Um, some useful properties of the mean and the variance. So let's start with the expected value. If you multiply random variable by something, the expected value gets multiplied by the same value. Um, that trivially follows from the definition. If you add two random variables, again, the expected values you can also add. This hold always holds true, just follows, it's basically a linear, um, a linear operation, the expectation. Um, if you multiply two, then it's more complicated. In general, the expected value of a product of two random variables is not equal to, to anything. It's not equal to the product of expectations. However, if your variables are statistically independent, then this holds true. And in fact, this is the definition, or one can take this as a definition of, uh, um, of independent random variables. And you can think about that, so imagine again throwing two dice, right? And, uh, pair dice independently, so the outcome here and the, the outcome here are um, not related to each other. And then you can ask what is the expected value of the product of the values, and if you write out the sum, um, then you will see that it actually decomposes into um, into two sums uh, directly because the probability to obtain like two here and three here is just the product of these probabilities uh, by because that's how independent um, events um, work. Now let's let's talk about the variance. If you if you multiply x by some number a, then the variance uh, will be multiplied by a squared. This, again, immediately formula, uh, follows from the definition because there's square in the definition. The sum, the variance of the sum is not equal to the sum of the variances. If you write it down, there will be covariance term, in fact, um, in addition. But if the two variables, x and y, are uncorrelated, then the covariance cancels out and you get this as, 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 a, as a true statement. And then finally, a very useful formula is that you can express variance of a random variable um, in, in terms of the expected value and the expectation of the square of the random variable. So this is something um, I'll probably leave as an exercise. Uh, can be um, simply proven and can be very useful if you, if you compute something. Okay, and the last thing we need will be a multivariate probability distribution. So a random variable x can be, can be in fact a random vector. So you generate a vector and each component of the vector is a random variable itself. So this we will call a random vector. So here's an example, it's a bit tricky to draw. So here's, a, I, I tried to, to draw um, a random variable that has two components. So this is a random vector in two dimensions. And then the probability distribution becomes like a, a surface that again is strictly positive, um, some kind of surface. The, the integral over the entire plane is one. Uh, and if you want to know how like, how what's the probability to get in a specific little rectangle um, on this x1, x2 plane, then you need to compute the 2D integral, so the volume of this, of this column and this will give you the probability. And this, of course, works then in many dimensions. You just need to, talk, to, to think about high dimensional integrals. So in two dimensions, it it's can be very convenient to draw it as we did similarly to how we did with loss functions in the previous lecture, to draw it as a, as a contour map on a x1, x2 um, plane. All right. So. Yeah, one more thing. So if a continuous multivariate random variable is described by, by probability density, then so how do our notions of expected value and variance work here? Well, for expected value, it works exactly the same as before. You just put the vectors in there. And what you get out is, of course, also a vector, right? So the expected value will be a vector because everything happens now in two dimensions, for example, in the previous, uh, on the previous slide. So expected value will also be um, two-dimensional, it's a vector. Now, now variance is a bit more tricky because if you, if you write out the definition of the variance how we had it before, we had x deviation from the average squared, right? But now deviation from the average is a vector. So what does it mean to square a vector? And in fact, one can write it like that. So this will be a matrix 
So if it's a two-dimensional um, uh, random variable, then this will be a two-by-two two matrix that on the previous slide where, we, where, where, I had a, where I had this ellipse that was stretched like that, one, um, so the diagonal values the diagonal elements of this matrix will be the variances of each component. So in the previous example, there will be there will be something on the diagonal that just describes the variance in the x1 direction and the variance in x2 direction. But then in that example like that, the x1 and x2 are positively correlated, so the covariance, something that stands off diagonal, um, is going to be non positive, non-zero. And then, of course, the covariance um, ij element of this matrix is the same as ji because this thing is symmetric over here. So it's a symmetric matrix. Um, yeah, so we never, so we, we're going to talk a lot in this course about um, high dimensional random variables, mostly Gaussian, and then we will be talking a lot about the covariance matrix. So take, make, be sure, make sure that you understand this definition and what it entails. Okay, so Gaussian distributions, that's the last thing we will need a lot today. A Gaussian, or also called normal distribution in one dimension, looks like that. It's a bell-shaped curve. Um, it, here's the probability density that, so important about this probability density is that this is essentially an exponent of minus x squared. You shift this by m by mu because mu will be the mean of this. So if you want to shift this thing to the left or to the right, just subtract it from x, right? And then here in the bottom you have sigma squared, which is the variance, and it scales and stretches um, or shrinks this entire um, this entire shape. So one would actually need to prove that if you take this formula, then the average, the expected value of this is mu and the variance is sigma squared. I'm not doing this here, just, just believe me that this works out. Um, if the mean is zero and standard deviation is one, this is called standard normal distribution, then the equation simplifies. And you might wonder why the, there's this one over square root of two pi uh, factor here and also above here. And this is there just so that the entire thing integrates to one. So if you if you remove that, and then you just have exponent of minus x squared, uh, one half of that, and you compute the integral, then it, this will turn out to be a square root of two pi. So you need this in order to make the whole thing integrate to one. And it's actually not um, trivial to compute this integral. So it even has a name, it's called um, Euler-Poisson integral. And it's not very complicated, but you need to apply a particular trick to be able to compute it. Um, so it's a famous uh, result in, in, in calculus. Okay, and now a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So a Gaussian distribution in, in several dimensions. Very similar to what we had before. It just needs to generalize. The mean becomes a vector. That's why I'm writing in bold here. And the variance becomes a covariance matrix. So one needs to write this thing uh, down somehow that uh, you can't just divide by sigma squared because now sigma is a covariance matrix. So it turns out what you can do is to write it like that. So you have the inverse of the covariance matrix up here. Um, and then again, this is the important part. If you compute the integral of that, it turns out that the determinant of this matrix um, gets into, into the integral result. That, that's why we need to normalize by that. But this, so everything in the beginning is just normalization factors. Conceptually, it's not very important. The important thing happens here. Okay, and we can put the zero vector as the mean and identity matrix. So remember, identity matrix is ones on the diagonal, zeros everywhere, and this will be called a standard multivariate normal distribution. It's symmetric in all directions. It has variance one. It's like a like a ball centered around zero zero. Uh, has a simple formula for its uh, density function. Okay, I think this is all that we will need at least today. Uh, to talk about um, the probabilistic model for linear regression. So let's write it, uh, let's get back to it. So here I'm writing it again, epsilon. Now you can appreciate what it really means. The epsilon is a random variable from a Gaussian distribution with mean zero, this is important, 
and um, some fixed uh, value of um, of the variance sigma squared. So here's how I think I suggest you should think about that. First, for the simple case of one variable, you have one variable x over here. You there is some true beta, and the this true beta defines this line, right? Um, the, the the regression line that relates y to x. But now, if you're generating values from this generative model, then for any x, for example, this is the value plus noise, and the noise comes from a Gaussian distribution. So it will end up, for example, up here, right, as I drew, but it could end up he down here or somewhere up here. That's this, this probability distribution denotes um, this, this variability over here. The same thing happens here if you have an x value over here or here. So if you put in a bunch of x variables, you will get out uh, a bunch of y values with noise on top. And it's very important here that the uh, this noise uh, values of epsilon that you get for different values of x in your data, they are uncorrelated, so you're independent, they are actually independent even statistically, you independently generate the uh, the noise, or sometimes it's called the error, here and here and here and here, everywhere. That's the first thing that's important. The second thing that is important that they have equal variance, right? For all values of x, this model has the same noise variance. So this uh, this has a fancy term in statistics, homocytosticity. Um, now, one more thing, um, if you if you think about a high dimensional situation where you have several predictors, for example, two, then it's exactly the same thing. So now you have a plane, x1, x2 plane, right? Um, we, we introduced it in the previous lecture. Then the y-axis goes vertically. You have not a regression line, but now you have a regression plane that, that is your, that is your um, average value of y for, for any x. And on top of that, you have random variation. And random variation is still one dimensional in the direction of y. So you have this plane, and random variation in the, in the y direction everywhere with the same variance. OK. Now, a very important concept in statistics and in machine learning is the likelihood. So let's, uh, let, let me introduce that. So think about having some fixed value of beta, the true value of beta, and think about having a particular value of x that is also fixed for now. Then the y's, so th I'm just repeating what I said right now, the y's follow a, a um, normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution with variance sigma squared around this beta transpose x average prediction. So we can write down the whole uh, probability density, and that describes uh, the density of getting different y's, right, at these beta and x values. Now we imagine that we have an entire data set of data, so we have bun a bunch of different x values, and we can ask, okay, so what's the probability density to, to observe a particular value of y zero for my x zero um, predictive vector and a particular value of y one for my next predictive value x one and y two for x two and so on. Um, and this is, of course, the probability is just multiplied because the noise is independent, as I said before. So I just write a product of whatever was above here going around all i, um, all, all, all training samples. So this is, at this moment, it's a function of y, right? This tells you what is the probability density to obtain particular y values. And now comes the trick. The trick is to now think about this expression as a function of beta and sigma squared and not anymore as a function of y. So now we imagine the expression stays exactly the same, but we imagine that we have already, that we are given some x values and some y values, which of course always is the case if you have some training data. So there's a given training set, xy, uh, xi, yi, and we can still plug that all in this formula and we can treat it now as a function of beta and sigma, which are two parameters of our generative model, right? 
And this is now called the likelihood. So the likelihood is just probability or probability density to generate the data reinterpreted as a function of parameters. And now this is useful because now we can ask, okay, what would be the values of beta and sigma squared that would make the data set that we have the most probable? So for which values of beta and sigma squared will this actually thing uh, be maximal? So this, this can be a little bit confusing the first time you, you, you hear that, so make sure you understand. So that we want to find beta and sigma that maximize the likelihood, so we can say the maximally likely beta and sigma, but this just means that we are asking for what beta and sigma the probability to observe this data um, was the highest. Okay, so this now becomes, so th that's called the principle of maximum likelihood is, um, tells us that, it's, that it makes sense to, to look for beta and sigma that maximize the likelihood. It can be a good estimate of the underlying beta and sigma that we don't know, but given a data set, we want to estimate them, right? So we can, there's different ways to estimate them. And if you have a generative probabilistic model, then for any model, you can ask what is the maximum likelihood estimate. So let's try to do it for linear regression. Um, so what we have up here is a big product of exponentials, and that's, um, that's typically annoying and cumbersome to work with. So what very often is very convenient, um, especially if you're dealing with Gaussian distributions, but in fact in, in, in other cases too, is to take the logarithm of this entire thing. If you want to maximize the likelihood, you can also maximize the log likelihood. Logarithm is a monotonic function. If you maximize the logarithm of something, you will equivalently maximize that something, right? So we will just take the logarithm and notice that if you take the logarithm, then of course this, this um, uh, coefficient in the beginning just ends up being, so the product turns into a sum, that's great. Within the sum, um, this product also turns into a sum. So this coefficient just ends up here because the sum over n training samples, is just you multiply by n because they are all the same, the interesting part is this the second part, right? So now you have the sum of the squared deviations of y minus beta x, and this ends up over here. And you have these minuses. You have a minus here, and you have a minus over there. Because we want to maximize the likelihood, so you're maximizing something that is negative. Uh, again, this is the, a li can be a little bit confusing. What people often do is they just, just remove the minus sign and call it negative log likelihood. And if you do that, then instead of maximizing likelihood, you want to minimize the negative log likelihood. So let me go on the next slide and rewrite this again. So this is now a negative log likelihood, the same thing as before, but without the minuses. And I can simplify this a bit more using the matrix notation from last lecture where, um, well, we discussed this a lot in the previous lecture, so you, you remember that this is just the squared norm of the error vectors, where the errors is just the difference between our responses and our predictions, which are given by x times beta. And now notice also that the first uh, term in the sum does not depend on, on beta at all, so only the second term depends on beta, so if you want to minimize so if you want to maximize the likelihood, you want to minimize the negative log likelihood, which is written out here, which means that you want to minimize the squared um, error, right? So we proved that maximizing the likelihood of this probabilistic model is equivalent to minimizing the squared error. And this gives one possible motivation for choosing or working with squared error in the first place. So remember we discussed two weeks ago, why is it that we're using the squared error as the loss in a, um, for linear regression, I said one uh, answer to that is that it's just mathematically turns out to be very simple. Another answer to that is that it follows from the maximum likelihood principle if you assume the Gaussian noise model, uh, which people often, um, which is convenient again mathematically and also often a reasonable assumption. One can ask here, what about sigma squared? 
I didn't say anything about sigma squared yet, but that's in fact also a parameter of the generative model. So there is some particular value of sigma squared that will maximize um, this likelihood. This I leave as an exercise. One can derive pretty easily from here what is the maximum likelihood solution for sigma squared. Okay, so now we have the beta hat, which is the same beta hat as, as of course in previous lectures, right? Because it turns out the maximum likelihood and least squares is just the uh, mathematically equivalent problems. Um, and if you, and so we're now always thinking about the input data as, as, as random, and then the beta hat becomes a random variable itself. It depends on the training data. So one can ask, what will be the statistical properties of beta hat? What is its mean? What is its variance or covariance matrix? And so on. So uh, to, to spell it out a bit more specifically, what I mean here, I imagine that beta is a fixed, it's a given vector, it will not change here. The x, my whole design matrix x, is also fixed, it will not change. But the epsilon, uh, the noise, this is random thing coming from a Gaussian distribution. So we can generate different y's, that's training set y's, so we can put x and y in the least squares estimate, obtain the value of beta hat, and then ask if we vary the epsilon, what, how the beta hat will vary as, 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 a, as a random variable depending on epsilon. So that's then the, the topic of the, um, of the next segment. And the first very important claim is that it turns out that the beta hat is an unbiased estimator of beta. So the, this means, by definition, that the expected value of beta hat is equal to beta, which sounds great, right? So you, you, you have this procedure to estimate the beta, you have the formula um, that, that, I that we discussed in the previous lectures, but I will write down now again. And in fact, the expected value is the true value. So let's prove that because that's very easy. Um, so that's the that's the definition of the not that's not a definition, but that's the formula for for beta hat that we derived last time, right? Now we're just asking what's the expected value of that. So let's plug x beta plus epsilon instead of the instead of y, and then we open the brackets and we have two terms. And now you can already see that the first term over here it has x transpose x minus one times x transpose x. So this is this by definition cancels out and you have expected value of beta and the expected value of beta with beta being fixed non-random um, value is just beta itself, right? So here we just have beta, so that's great. Let's look at the second term. Here we have something, 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 some matrix times epsilon. Epsilon is a vector of, stand of uh, random Gaussian values with mean zero. So you have some matrix times this vector. It means that you will get a vector where each, where each component of this vector is some linear combination of the original values in the, in the epsilon vector. So you have linear combinations of random variables that have mean zero. And the expected value of that is zero for any linear combination, which is why this entire term on the right is zero, a vector of zeros, which means that the whole expression is just beta. So here we proved it. The beta hat, the ordinary least squares estimator, is an unbiased estimator. Note as a remark here that this only works, uh, this proof works out if I can actually say that x transpose x minus one and x transpose x cancels out, or in fact, even the formula above here, even the first step already how I wrote this, only makes sense if x transpose x is in invertible matrix, right? So this means that x has to have more rows than columns, you have the sample size has to be larger than, than the number of predictors and there should not be any singular uh, values that are equal to zero. Uh, and this is called a full rank matrix X if this holds. So this is just an assumption behind this entire thing. Okay, so we proved that the beta is an unbiased estimator. Now we can ask, okay, so on average, we get back the true beta. 
but that's an average. Every single time, you of course get something different from this hat. So how does the covariance matrix of this beta hat vector looks like? And another theorem would be that the covariance matrix of beta hat is just given by the x transpose x inverse times sigma squared, and this is something that can be proven very similar to, to, um, to my previous slide, and I'm not going to do it here, but this is left as an exercise for you. Um, I want to spell out a bit more the conceptual uh, interpretation of this. So covariance of beta hat describes the uncertainty around your estimate beta hat. So if you, if you for example, use some um, software to, uh, you put in some data and the software gives you the beta hat estimate and then it will give you like confidence intervals or some uncertainties around each of the estimates. So these uncertainties come from this matrix. Right? If this covariance is very large, uh, like the individual variances, for example, in this covariance matrix are very large, this means that, okay, your estimate is here, but actually there's a lot of uncertainty around it. Um, if, uh, if all the values are small, that means the uncertainty is small. You can have correlations in this x plus plus x minus one matrix, which means that your um, estimates of your individual parameters in, in your linear regression will be correlated. This can happen. And again, you see, as we discussed last time, if x transpose x is a, is a diagonal matrix, if everything, all your predictions are uncorrelated, have the same variance, um, then this simplifies a lot. Then the, the, co the entire covariance matrix will also be diagonal, for example. And if, it's, if this thing is identity matrix, then this will also be um, just proportional to the identity matrix, which again, um, so this just brings me back to what I, what I mentioned last time, that um, strong correlations in the, um, between your predictors will lead to problems, and here we see this more directly, that some of these problems will be uh, large uncertainties in the covariance matrix of beta hat. A very important result in statistics is um, called Gauss-Markov theorem. Now we can state it. It says that beta hat is the small, has the smallest variance among all unbiased linear estimators of beta. And this even has a special term in statistics, it's called a blue estimator, the best linear unbiased estimator. So the best here means that it's a linear unbiased estimator with the smallest variance. So let me just define this a little bit more precise because you might think, okay, the variance, what does the variance mean here? The beta hat is a vector, right? I, this is a pretty strong result. It means actually that the variance in every direction is smaller. So if you think about like the ellipse, on my two-dimensional picture before, the ellipse around the beta hat will be small, will be entirely within an ellipse for any other estimator that one can come up with. So writing down any other possible formula apart from um, the formula for beta hat, a linear formula, will, will lead to, if this yields an unbiased estimate, then it will have larger variance. So here's the technical definition of, of what a larger variance means. It means the variance in any direction is larger, or another way to say it is that the difference between the covariance matrix of any other estimator and the estim our least squares estimator beta hat is, um, has all positive um, singular values. It's called positive semi-definite matrix, non-negative singular values, sorry. I'm not going to prove this theorem, um, not even as an exercise. But this is a very important result. It, it provides justification for another justification for why uh, this um, particular procedure, beta hat, is a, is a good procedure, right? It's, it's some kind of a statistical guarantee that you are getting the best, um, the best estimate among all unbiased estimates. What I do want to stress though here is, okay, so the Gauss-Markov theorem tells us that beta hat is the best linear unbiased estimator does this mean that this is actually just the best estimator, that this is something that we're gonna always be using because it's the best? And the answer to this is no, it does not mean that. It's the best, it has the linear variance among unbiased estimators, but if you allow yourself, if you, if you consider some biased estimators, then you might have smaller variance than that. And you might wonder, okay, but the unbiased sound pretty good, why would you want to consider biased estimates, like if you say that something is biased, this sounds, even just from, from, the, from the language itself, it sounds 
not very good, right? And this brings us to the, uh, to the entire topic of the bias variance trade-off, underfitting and overfitting. So let me, um, let me introduce these concepts to you, but in order to do it, the, the way I prefer to, to illustrate that is using polynomial regression. So for a small, a brief, short aside, uh, let's talk about polynomial regression. So imagine, let's, let's go back to the example I used. In the very beginning, we are predicting height from, was it height from weight? Let's, no, height from age. We're predicting height from age um, of, of, of students. And we can think, okay, so the linear, the linear function that relates height to age is good, but maybe after some age, the, you know, the height doesn't grow anymore. So maybe we can add some more nonlinear terms. We can add x squared, so x kids would be the age. So we can add, add x squared and x um, to the third power, to the fourth, fifth power, whatever, to our model. And then we have something like that and we want to estimate that. That, that sounds reasonable. So this is, this is called polynomial regression. And you can ask, or let me ask you, how would you estimate these beta coefficients in a model like that? And you might, like the first you know, gut reaction, reaction might be that you don't know. Because now we, we talked a lot, we talked for two and a half lectures about how to estimate um, coefficients for a linear function. This is obviously a non-linear function of of x, so how would you go um, about estimating its coefficients? Well, turns out that I'm just obscuring things here because this is still a linear regression. So why is it still a linear regression? Because this is a linear function of coefficients. All betas enter this equation just as linear terms, right? And we can treat x squared and x to the third power, which of course are nonlinear function of x, but we can treat them as just new features. So you can, for this particular model written down here, you can think about the design matrix. It will have like the column of ones, then the column of axes, so different different ages in your sample. And then you just square all the ages and that's your next column. Then you, then you raise the ages to the third power and that's your next column. And then you just have your design matrix. And then this thing is just still can be written as x beta, right? So it's the linear function of parameters that makes the model linear. We don't really care about the, um, about whether this is a linear function of predictors or not. This is just not important. This is still linear regression as long as it's a linear function of the parameters. And this applies to um, um, everywhere. So if you have, if somebody tells you we have a nonlinear model, like a neural network or, or anything, our model is nonlinear, this means it's a nonlinear function of the parameters. Otherwise, it's a linear model. So this is still a linear regression. Well, great. Okay. So we can we can um, just keep um, applying all our intuitions about linear regression to this polynomial regression situation. And here's the example that I want to use. So we're still we're still talking about predicting like y from x. There's just one variable x here. Um, and let's imagine that the true relationship is, as I said, it's not exactly linear. So it's something that looks like that. Right? It, it levels off. And let's also imagine that we don't have a lot of training data. We just have a few points, as in my sketch over here. So if we just fit the linear function of x also, so just two parameters, um, it will not fit very well. It will, maybe you don't see this on this picture, it will become clearer um, when I open the, the next part of this slide, but it, it, it's not perfect. Like here it underestimates the data and here it will overestimate the data because the data levels off and my function does not. So this is called underfitting. This happens whenever your model that you're fitting is too, is too simple, right? It's not expressive enough. It cannot, uh, it's not flexible enough. It, it, it cannot fit the, all the properties of the data that we have here. And uh, statistical term here would be that this has a high bias because our predictions are biased. Here, if you fit that, your prediction here for this value of x is just below the truth value always. So you're biased. Okay, now the data is the same. Well, imagine please that the data is, uh, are exactly the same in the subplots, but now I'm adding x squared and I'm fitting this quadratic polynomial of x. 
and it fits much better. Or if the true data is, is also quadratic, then that's, that's as good as you can do uh, here, right? So the squared error, in what sense does it do better? For example, you can measure the squared error. You look here, the squared error is, is small, but here you will get larger error here and also larger error around here. Now comes the crucial part. We can in keep increasing the degree of the polynomial that we're fitting. And since the amount of data that we have here is, is, is small, there's maybe 10 points, then if you increase the polynomial enough, so it, if you get to the polynomial of degree 10 also, then something like that will happen. The error, the mean squared error, the, your loss will become smaller and smaller when you go to the right. And here it might be close to zero, or in fact it might be exactly zero if you can find the polynomial that, that goes exactly through each of the points in your data set, right? So you're fitting your training data perfectly at this point. The error, the loss is just exactly zero, but you're fitting well, but this is an overfitting. And why is it an overfitting? Because the, the, the model that you're getting out has of course nothing to do with the true underlying um, generative model of this data, which means that if you're now asking, like a new person comes along and the age is somewhere here, then your model will predict a very large height, which of course is, um, will be completely wrong. So if you test this model on new data, then, you will s then your error will be uh, very large. And this happens because this model is now too flexible. It's so flexible that you can bend it, you can, you can choose the coefficients that will go just perfectly, approximate your training data very well, overfit the training data, uh, and yield a terrible model. So when I say too flexible, this means too flexible for the data that you have. It doesn't mean that it's in general too flexible. Somehow it's not so much a property of the model, it's a property of the model as related to the given data set. Our training data in this example is very, very small. So if your model is so rich that it can fit the entire training data, you can have a situation like that where you overfit. And this is also called a situation with high variance. Um, and let me make sure that, so let me make it clear what does high variance mean here. High variance is, as I said before, it's variance with respect to different training data that you might get. So if you now think that you generate different training data sets with the same sample size, for example, then here on the left, you generate a different data and you will get the straight line that is very similar to this. Like it will change a little bit, but it will, it will not change much from one training data to the next. Here it will also, it will, it will, it will stay pretty much the same all the time either. But here on the, on the very right, this is not the case. You generate a different data. And I need a completely different wiggly polynomial that will fit this training data. So your, you will have high variance of your beta coefficients when you imagine that you do this on different data sets. And your predictions will also have very high variance. Like as I said, here, here, you, here you're generating very high uh, prediction for this x value, but maybe with a different data set, you will generate like a very, very low uh, prediction for the same value of x. So that's what high variance here refers to. So you see here that we have something like a, like a spectrum of models, right? And here you have high bias, and here you have high variance. And uh, this, in fact, is very uh, common situation where you have bias variance trade off So this can occur not only in the polynomial fittings, but actually everywhere, and I will have other examples, um, but very often you can change something about how you do, how you fit your model or how you express your model and this will move you between having a large bias or having a large variance. Um, I want to give a bit more mathematically exact definition of the bias variance trade-off. And um, so let's consider the mean squared error of our predictions. So here y will be the, the actual response values from our generative model, and f uh, hat from x is our estimates. Um, for example, through 
polynomial regression, but this even doesn't matter on this particular slide. So our loss is mean squared error, and we're asking, okay, what's the expected value of the squared error that you will get on the test data? This is about test data. So in the future, I give you a new y, what will be the expected, um, what will be the expected squared error? So the, the y itself is just f from x plus epsilon, and epsilon is the, is the additive noise that's uncorrelated with anything else that we're considering here. So you can open the squared brackets, and whenever you have epsilon squared, the expected value of epsilon squared will be the sigma squared, the squared variance of the noise, and all terms where epsilon is multiplied by something will cancel out, as we discussed before in a different derivation. So I can just take epsilon out of there and say that it's plus sigma squared. And what you're left here is the difference between the true f and the f hat squared expected value. And now this can be, it turns out that this can be decomposed into something that we will call bias and the something that we will call the variance. Um, the, in order to see that it can be decomposed like that, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a little trick here. I'm adding this and subtracting the same, the same quantity expected value of um, f hat and then I split this into two terms. I want a square of this, and I want a square of this. And then, of course, there's a two this times this term as well. But what will happen here is that, okay, so this is the square of the first term. This is the, w I will interpret this on the next line. This is the square of the, of the second term. Oh, wait, so expected value got disappeared here. Why didn't this happen? Well, this is not random variable anymore, f from x, that's just something that, that is out there, right? It's not random. Expected value of f hat is not random anymore because this, this is already the expected. The, all the randomness is averaged out when I, when I write, after I applied expected value. So it's just a number or a function in this case, but it's not random. So it, it had expected value in front, but I just removed it. Um, expected value of any number is just this number, right? Here, expected value remains, and then there is this term that is two, the first thing times the second thing, but it turns out that this is all equal to zero very conveniently because this will be zero, because here you have f hat minus expected value of f hat, and you're computing the expected value of that. So what's the expected value of different non-squared differences from something to the mean? This is just zero because the, we can open the brackets and this will be expected value of f. And this is expected value of the expected value of f, which is just expected value of f hat, and it's cancel out and it's zero, great. So we're just left with this. And the first thing here, so now look close at these terms that survived. This is the difference between the true function and the average of our predictions. This is called squared. So this is squared bias. And the second thing is the expected value of the squared deviations of our predictions from the average prediction. And this is the variance, also by definition of the variance, plus there is a sigma squared, which uh, sometimes in this context will be called an irreducible noise. Like even if you know the true f, if you don't need to fit anything, like an oracle gives you the true f, you still will have a mean squared error of sigma squared because there's always a noise on the new data that is impossible to predict, right? So this sigma squared thing is irreducible noise, but the thing that can be reduced um, by fitting the model, the, the squared error there can be decomposed into squared error and the variance. And this actually, so you, you see this is nothing about linear regression here. This can actually apply to any estimator. Whenever you have any statistical estimator of anything, you can say that the mean squared error of this estimator will be can be decomposed into squared bias and the variance, so that's very useful, and you will often see it in different contexts. This was a technical derivation. Now let me, um, let me give you a very non-technical intuition here. So what does it mean to have high or low bias or high or low variance? And here's an example that is often used for that. It's a darts. So imagine that we're playing darts, and this is the um, this is where what I want to hit, right? And I want to be close to the center. And if I have low bias and low variance, then I'm just good, and all my um, I always hit the the bullseye. Now, what happens if I have still low variance, but now I have high bias? That just means that I consistently m 
miss the sanctum. I, I, I very consist, so my, my, somehow the noise in my motor system is, is low. I always hit the same place, but there's some systematic error and I end up always on one side of where I need to. So this will be high bias. This thing is the squared bias. It's the difference between my average, um, well, prediction, in this case, average um, hit position and where I want to be over here, the true one, right? So this squared is the squared bias. Okay, a different situation will be high variance but low bias. Now, on average, on average, I am in the center, I am unbiased, but my variance is very large, it's just, I'm, I'm, um, it ends up all over the place. And of course you can have high variance and high bias um, where the variance is large and it's also all shifted. So of course you want to be here on the down left, but this may not be possible. Um, this just is, is bad, obviously, but the bias variance trade-off is moving you along, along this axis, right? So you can, you, you're moving from either having large variance and low bias, and this is actually what can happen if you use the least squares estimator, right? It has zero bias, we proved that, but the variance can be high in some situations. Or you can say, well, maybe, maybe I can trade a bit of the variance for the bias. Now I have some bias over here, but the variance is small. And if, you, if what you want is to have a small square distance to the center, then it can be that the square distance here is smaller than the square distance here. Or in fact, maybe it's not, but maybe somewhere here along this spectrum trade-off, somewhere here you have the minimum squared error, right? So you're trading some variance for some bias or vice versa, and if you want to optimize the squared error, then there may be some optimal creep there. That is the intuition. And now getting back to the polynomial fitting example, but now it's not my, my, my sketches anymore, but I'm just taking the actual fits from, from Bishop's machine learning book, uh, but he does the same thing. So this is, I think there's nine points in here and the true uh, line is shown in green and these are fits of polynomials of different degrees, zero, one, three, and, and nine. And by the time you're up to nine, you're perfectly fitting your data with zero error. And here is a helpful table that shows the um, that shows the values of coefficients that you get for this particular data set uh, when you fit these polynomials of different degree. And something interesting ha happens here. So look at that. If you go, if you increase the degree of the polynomial, by the time you get to really high degree polynomial where you fit your data very well with very little error or possibly even with zero error at some point, you get huge coefficients. These coefficients are very, very large. And uh, this makes sense, I think it makes sense intuitively. You need this function that's very wiggly that exactly passes through the given points. Well, you, you need a lot of wiggle space to, to achieve that. So you may need to have some very large positive coefficients and very large negative coefficients and the function will somehow cancel it and, 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 and make it pass through all these points. This also makes sense if you think about the formula for the coefficients themselves, right? So this is the formula for the beta hat. Uh, which has this x transpose x to the power of minus one. Um, and if you think about this x matrix that you get here, as you increase the dimensionality, you have the same nine points living in a higher and higher and higher and higher dimensional space. By the time you get to the nine dimensional space, you have nine points in nine dimensional space. This means that there's some direction in this nine dimensional space with very little um, singular value, right? It's like if you have two points on a plane, then actually one singular value will just be zero um, because there's always a line passing through the, um, through any two points on the plane. The same uh, thing happens here in, in high dimensions when your dimensionality approaches the, your sample size, then this cloud of points in this high dimensional space actually has some directions that have very, very small variance and eventually it hits zero. And that's the point where you can fit the data perfectly, but that also means that when you invert this X transpose X matrix, um, you will get, you, you're inverting very small singular values, so you're getting some very large coefficients. So there's just algebraic 
explanation for why the coefficients gets very large. This will be important later. This will be very important in the next lecture also. Here I just want to say that this is only, this, this all of that holds for the fixed sample size. So here the, on the first row, the data are fixed and this is just nine points, or is it 10? So it's just a few points. Now we can ask, okay, let, let's always fit ninth degree polynomial, but now we increase the sample size. And if your sample size is huge, then you can still use ninth degree polynomial and it fits very well. And the prediction is very close to the, to the green line. So you're not overfitting. You're only overfitting. That's what I said before, what I meant before. You're overfitting if your model is too flexible relative to the amount of data you have. If you have a lot of data, then the same model will stop being too flexible. It's now, it's now all right. It may be you don't need ninth degree polynomial to fit that. You can use third degree polynomial. Um, but nothing bad happens if you do use ninth degree. To overfit this thing over here, you would need maybe, um, a, I don't know, 100 degree polynomial or higher. Okay, we're almost done. I want to, to finish with um, introducing this kind of plot that, um, that, is, um, that is also very, very important for us and will be important in the future. So now we, we want to summarize this thing that we saw on the previous slide. This is a plot where on the horizontal axis is a number of predictors. So we're starting with zero predictors. This means you just fit the, the straight horizontal line. You only fit the, the intercept. That's the simplest model you can have in this, in this setup. And then you, if, as you increase the number of predictors, so this just means adding the second power, the third power, the fourth power's predictors, right? Then, then you, you, you go to the right here. That's the number of predictors. And let's imagine that the sample size is fixed, or in fact, the whole data set is fixed. Um, at some point, you will hit, your, your number of predictors will reach uh, the sample size. And then at this is the point where your training loss goes to zero you can fit your data perfectly. Whereas in the beginning, when your number of predictors is zero, which means the intercept is still in there, um, you have some high loss. And the loss just monotonically decreases. You, you cannot have lower value of your, um, of your mean squared error if you add another predictor. This is not possible. If you add a predictor, whatever the predictor is, it can only decrease your, uh, it can only improve the fit. It, so it means it can only decrease the mean squared error, right? It's not possible to, make the fit worse by adding another predictor. It makes the model more flexible so it can fit the data better. That's why the training curve here, the, the loss, uh, the mean squared error on the training data just goes down. The very important thing that we are after here is that we are thinking about the test loss. So we will talk about that next week too, but just think about making a prediction for the value that you haven't seen before. Somewhere you are interpolating um, on all these plots with polynomials. And now, if you, as we saw before, at some point, so the test here, maybe your model is not flexible enough, you're underfitting. Then it becomes better, better, better. The test also improves. Here is maybe the perfect situation. And then if you increase, if you add even more predictors, you start overfitting. And the overfitting manifests itself in this growing gap between the training loss that goes down and the test loss that goes up. And by the time um, you hit zero here, the test loss, it may even diverge or, or, be, um, or be very high. So that's a trade-off. That's underfitting, that's overfitting, this is high bias here, this is high variance here, um, and there's some, some um, optimal position in between. Because what you care, of course, is the test uh, performance of your model and not the training performance of your model. And we, as we, as we discussed, um, if we look at the test error only here, then it turns out it can be decomposed into squared bias and the variance. And that's how, so the variance just increases all the time if, if you increase the number of predictors, whereas the bias decreases. And in fact, by the time, so let's say the underlying model, uh, the true model, I know, is a polynomial of degree five. So by the time you reach five, you reach the degree five, you will have zero bias because now you have all predictors that you need. And uh, we proved earlier that the linear regression estimates are unbiased. So you can only have bias here if you didn't, if you didn't put some 
predictors that you needed into your model in the first place, then of course you will be biased. If all the predictions are there, then you will have zero bias. So the bias actually can hit zero already earlier here, but the variance will increase. In any case, bias goes down, variance goes up, and if you add them up, you get something that has a minimum, and that's the test mean squared error. So this is, I use this number of predictors in the, in the polynomial regression as, as uh, to, to illustrate these concepts. I think that's the clearest probably situation uh, that I know where this occurs. But the same phenomenon, as I said, can happen in different situations um, where you have something else on the x-axis. We will, we will, I will show you an example next time. And also you can think of a situation where you just have some predictors that are not polynomials. You just have some data, somebody gives you the data, nothing is, nothing is square or third power of another, of another feature, but you just have some data and it has a lot of predictors. Maybe you have a sample size of a thousand and predictors and there's 500 predictors. That's just what the data are and you need to construct some model out of that. And this you may be in the regime where you are overfitting because this is too many predictors for this um, amount of data, but you don't know what to kick. It's not that you can kick out some predictors or you maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe they are useful for something. So what to do in this case? And the answer that you can regularize your model, and this is something that we're going to talk about next week. Thank you.